Aloha, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. You can go to live in France, but you cannot become a Frenchman. You can go to live in Germany or Turkey or Japan, but you cannot become a German, a Turk, or Japanese. But anywhere from any corner of the earth can come to live in America and become American. Welcome back to A Nation of Immigrants, a new talk show program featuring the lives of immigrants, knowledge, diversity, and inclusion. Brought to you by Think Tank Hawaii and the Kingsfield Law Office. We invite renowned immigrants to discuss their life stories, immigration adventures, and the contribution to cult cultural diversity. Today's guest is our good friend, Martin Hedman, automation consultant and rolling coach, a dual citizen of the United Kingdom and the United States, an R&D expert in automation and machine learning, Martin Hedman has been working with business units and process automation development teams to deliver efficiencies and advanced analytics using the latest robotic process automation and machine learning tools. Martin is also a college rolling crew coach. He started coaching Oxford University Bomb School during summer eighth week, but after completing a British rolling coaching program focused on 2,000 meters multi-lane racing. Martin Hedman is a graduate from Nottingham Trent University and has spent four seasons with the Great Britain lightweight team and the GBR Olympic hand coach, Mark Lees. Martin moved to Minnesota in 2001 and founded the Lake Elmer Rolling Club. Today, he's a college rolling coach at the University of Minnesota. Welcome back, Martin. Thanks, John. Great to be here. Yeah, let's. Well, you've been come to our show a couple of times, but today we're going to talk about you. And uh, not, of course, obviously, we talk about your expertise uh, uh, in uh, in the previous episode. But today we're going to focus on you. You are dual dual citizen of the United Kingdom and the United States. Are you a? But in the Americans' view, you are forever a uh, British. So I, this is better situation than my situation because I'm a forever a Chinese in American view. And uh, even worse, my American friends think I'm too Chinese to be American. And my Chinese friends think I'm too American to be Chinese. But I do want to ask you the question about the reverse cultural shock. You recently spent a few months, uh, the last year or this year, spent a couple of months in the UK. And do you feel uh, something different? Yes, yeah, so I think there is a special relationship between the UK and the US. Um, as you you can hear, my accent uh, has been stubbornly British for as long as we've known each other. Um, but uh, when I went back to uh, London uh, this year, I was there for three months. Apparently, there are certain words that I say which clearly call out my American uh, uh, location. Um, they the English ear is not sophisticated enough to tell the difference between east coast west coast uh, the deep south or the midwest they just say i'm an american so that's what happened on this trip um i was called out a couple of times are you you know have you spent time in america actually yes i've been there 20 20 odd years so um so the accent gives it away for sure okay well i want to share with you my favorite quote from Yun Wen, the first Chinese student to graduate from American University. He stated at the beginning of his autobiography, would it not be strange if an accidental education continually exemplified by an occidental civilization had not read upon an oriental such as metamorphosis in his inward nature as to make him feel and act as though he were a being coming from a different world when he confronted one so diametrically different. Did you feel the reverse cultural shock when you interact with your fellow British? I, I did, but it was a continuation of the conversations I've had over the last 25 years working for global organizations like Thomson Reuters and uh, 3M in particular, where there are three categories of people who I come across in daily life. There's obviously 
the Americans that pick up on my British accent, my British background. There's the British uh, who pick up on the American side of it. And then there's a very interesting third category, which are, there's an awful lot of dual citizens in both countries, American with British backgrounds, British with American backgrounds. And there's more than you realize. And when I'm in a conversation with them, there's almost this, this sort of knowing look where the conversation turns very quickly to how do you feel either being part of the global village, you know, not really coming from anywhere, or particularly for Anglo-Americans, where, where is home? You know, this conversation I've had at many airports, you know, sitting alongside um, other dual citizens on, on long flights. And, you know, over the years, that conversation has, has changed to, oh, that's interesting, to hang on, I'm not sure. Uh, where home is. But I, I'd say, um, just to answer your question, I think you have to um, create your own sense of home, whether that's in the UK or the US, you have to you know, make a decision where, where is your family going to say that it comes from in subsequent years. So, you know, as my, as my daughter and son-in-law, you know, tell their story, you know, who do they say I am? Um, and so I try to encourage them by um, by telling my story that I'm from the Midwest, but with roots in, in the UK. Um, so I feel quite strongly about my 20 years spent in St. Paul, uh, Minnesota, and who it's, who it's allowed me to become over the last two decades. So it's a long way to answer your, your question, but I'd say it's about taking control and, and, dis, and defining yourself on how you, how you answer that question. From what viewpoint? Very well said. It, where is home is a deceptively simple but exquisitely profound question for people like us. But right. you once said you don't feel uh, English. Could you elaborate? Yeah, it's a bit that? more com complicated. So I'll I'll give you the sort of cliff notes version. So my my father was from the north coast of Ireland. Um, it's an area called Ulster. Now, technically, it's part of the United Kingdom, but um, my family that are still there have a very thick Irish accent. Um, it's an Ulster accent, but um, it's undeniably Irish. And so when he moved to London in the 60s, before he met my mother, he felt there was, um, he was going to have to change his accent. So he took elocution lessons uh, to allow him to apply for jobs and be considered as an equal candidate. And, um, and so I, I grew up feeling that we weren't really an English family. We had um, strong roots in Northern Ireland, even though I sounded English. All of my uh, wider family members were from the, a farming community in Ulster that we would visit every every summer and loved it, loved, loved that experience. So um, when you go to school, um, you know, particularly in London, it, it's it's a very um, it, it is racist. You know, if you're different, you get you kind of get picked on. Um, while I didn't look like I was from a different uh, country, you know, people started to realise my family was Irish, and there was certainly negative sentiments um, ar around that fact. So I, I never really felt I was part of the uh, the the what, what it you know what you describe as being born and being brought up uh, in England. So it was very easy for me to leave the UK, for example, um, in 2001, uh, because I, I didn't really feel I was leaving anything uh, behind. Thank you uh, for sharing that. I um, just to tell you, tell you a little bit about myself. I thought oh. I was 100% Han Chinese until I did the DNA testing. 23 and me, and then I, uh, the, the result showed me that I'm like from the five, six different ethnic groups. And I have, have you get a chance to do the DNA testing? If, no, I haven't, no. What did you, what did you find? I, I'm let, I'm, I can only disclose here on air that I'm <laughs> not a hundred percent Chinese. And I have a, a pretty solid connection with many ethnic uh, uh, groups all over the world. And I, I'm now I'm, I feel pretty proud of it. 
But anyway, back to your story, Martin, and uh, just tell us how you settled in Minnesota, and we want to hear your, your uh, immigration adventure. Yeah, so I'll, I'll keep this real short because I'm, I'm 60 next weekend, so you know I've lived a lot of years, so I, I'd say I've had four phases, um, certainly growing up, going to school, high school, in London was um, was important for me, particularly as I wasn't a particularly gifted student. I was uh, below average in everything. Um, and so things really changed for me when I went to university and I discovered the sport of rowing and became a student athlete. Um, that, that was a big um, change in terms of developing a work ethic and competing, um, particularly at the national level and international level. I went through a huge change in personality from the age of 19 to uh, 23, 24. And then after my time as an athlete ended, I was picked up more or less straight away by um, a great company, Thomson Reuters. And I worked for Thomson Reuters for 28 years. And I just had so many great opportunities come my way that I always grabbed um, and developed and, and was um, mentored, very important to, to know how to work through difficult uh, work situations. I was mentored every step of the way. And it was through Thomson Reuters that I was introduced, first of all, to the US um, as a country, but also as a trading partner, as a uh, collaborating um, entity with the UK, very strong um, trans transatlantic teams I was on for at least 10 years. And then when the opportunity came to work um, in St. Paul, Minnesota, I grabbed that opportunity, loved, loved my time on the project team. I loved St. Paul, Minnesota as a visitor first. And then when there was an opportunity for the company to sponsor my green card, I grabbed that too. Um, and then after I think five years, um, I, I pursued the naturalization process. Again, at every step, uh, sponsored by Thomson Reuters. So I'm hugely grateful to that, uh, that, that company uh, along that journey. As you know, it's a, not an easy path to tread. Thank you. Uh, of course, we are all grateful. And I'm great, particularly grateful I met you at Thomson Reuters. That's right. And, and uh, so how long did you, uh, how, how many years did it take for you to, uh, to get a green card? I know the fight and naturalization. Uh, yeah, it was, it, it, was a, it was a little bit of a hiccup um, because I, I was offered an opportunity to work as an expat, as an American expat, even though I was technically British. Um, there was an opportunity for four years uh, to spend uh, in Switzerland working with um, software development, uh, part of uh, Thomson Reuters. And when I came back, the uh, USCIS rejected my application, saying that I'd taken uh, a four years break from paying taxes. And so I had to start the entire process again. Um, and you know me, Chung, I can be argumentative sometimes. And uh, I challenged them back to prove that I had not paid taxes since I, I was armed with every single tax submission for 10 years. And so they weren't able, I'm sure this doesn't work today, you know, that level of interaction with your case officer, I'm sure it's all remote now, but uh, we were sitting across the desk at each other and I showed him, well, show me which year specifically I didn't pay taxes. And he wasn't able to, uh, to, to, to continue with the rejection. He said, oh, well, if you've paid taxes, then, then you, of course you're able to um, continue. And he, ha he hand wrote on a red, red biro, red pen, on my rejection letter to say, administrative mistake, um, our error, the USCIS error, um, I am proving uh, this case to move forward. So um, it didn't take any longer, um, but there was a, an interesting two month period where the USCIS had to review my case again, and then I proceeded with the, uh, so I think it took five years for the green card and another three years, was it? I think, so eight years in total to become naturalized and, uh, and to you know, graduate from the ceremony. Yeah, it's an amazing story. And which year uh, the, the story you, you mentioned, the, your, your face to face with the CIA? Yeah, two, 2012. So I'd been back from Switzerland a couple of years. 
um, and then I graduated from the ceremony in 2013. Um, one of the most emotional moments of my life actually was uh, listening to a pre-recorded um, message from Barack Obama um, and it affected me more than I realized. I was expecting it to be pre-recorded of course, you know, <laughs> you're not going to get a personal uh, you know, dependence <laughs> from uh, Barack, um, but he, he obviously had put a lot of time and thought into how difficult it is for immigrants uh, to go through the process and he was, he, he spent a lot of time talking about the, our own personal journeys and what we'd had to go through to get to this moment. And now we had made it. Here were his um, expectations um, from us as citizens. And he spent a lot of time talking about how important immigrants were to the, Amer the American dream and the, particularly the um, voting system. Um, and I got, it really got me actually. I was, um, it took you know, a couple of weeks for me to think through all those messages and realize you know, it was a huge um, cultural change I'd made, um, and and I was going to be a good American, and I, and I'm and I'm and I believed it, and I still believe it, um, and I think I would have got there anyway. But but Barack Obama spelling it out, it certainly accelerated the thought the thought process. It's uh, it's uh, moving to hear that you know you were moved by President Obama's welcome speech to new citizens. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't have a chance to listen to the president's welcome speech at the naturalization ceremony because that was under Donald Trump. And um, either he didn't bother to record a message nor or the presiding judge didn't bother to play it. But anyway, uh, you become American, what exactly mean to become American? And uh, I remember one of the, my favorite uh, TV anchor mentioned that America is a narrative, it's a story, it's not ethnic a group, it's not a, a, we don't share you know the same history, same ethnic roots, but we do share a one we do share the same belief in a one document, the U.S. Constitution, and you said you are a big supporter of the Constitution. Mm -hmm. it's planned that to me yeah and can i if you've got uh, uh this is a two-minute story um okay, so sure. in, in 1994 um i was sent to washington dc by thomson reuters i was a product developer launching a new product in in the north american market us and canada and our sales and marketing group were in washington dc and i'd be never been to the us before and um i was prepped by some americans i worked with um, to go to some of the monuments, uh, maybe even get into the White House. They had a special um, uh, lo uh, location to report to. You didn't have to apply before. You just go to a particular office, say you're from another country, and they would take you a walk around the, the White House. So as a joke, they gave me, this is my, coll my American colleagues, and I have it here, the a pocket sized uh, book of the Constitution. It was really meant as a joke. You know, you're going to America, you'll need the Constitution to get in. You know, that's that sort of thing. And um, and but on the flight over there, I did read it um, and I was struck by the principles behind it. And remember, there's no equivalent in the UK. So, you know, we were brought up to believe we were citizens. I mean, this is very young age that the Queen was paramount to you know, society, the legal system very much reports to Her Majesty's government, not a separate branch of government. It's very much connected to the legal process and the Queen or the royal family signing off on. So it's a, it's a slightly different system, even though the American law is based on English common law. But this, the Constitution was the first time I kind of understood the, the, the concept of, of checks and balances. So I decided to, to go along to the White House as my first stop after work. And I, I dutifully uh, lined up uh, on this in this line, and I, I was quite respectful of the Constitution and the, and 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 being in the U.S. So I, I wore a grey suit, I wore a, a white shirt and a tie. You know, if I was going to go to the White House, I, w I wanted to show my respect. And I joined this line of tourists, um, who were not in suits. There was a lot of uh, shorts and t-shirts, and I felt over totally overdressed. And while I was waiting 
in this long line for 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 you know foreigners to to view the White House. I noticed another line forming in parallel, a shorter one, um, but they were all in national dress, and these were uh, Native Americans, so you know, resplendent in in their their native uh, colors and uh, and the par various paraphernalia that was you know very well put together. And I thought you know. I'm just going to join the other line. Um, I feel more comfortable, even though obviously I look very different. You know, here's a here's a group of people who are who who respect where they are. I, I feel more comfortable in that line. So I joined the other line. It was just a little bit shorter, um, not much shorter, but uh, I noticed that there were a lot of other people in grey suits at the front of the line, and they they undid the the barrier and let this line in first. And I thought oh, I lucked out here. So I, I proceeded to follow this group into the White House. Uh, we went into one of the main halls and it was an antechamber or an ante room uh, for, you know, with, with seats and clearly, I, okay, we're just gonna be briefed or something. So I'm sitting with all these uh, Native Americans and talking with them, just, you know, I was listening to where they were from. They were, they were intrigued that I was from the UK. So we were, there was a lot of banter, a lot of fun. And, uh, and then one of the other gray suited guys said, uh, President Bill Clinton will be um, in to see you in five minutes. And I thought, whoa, this is, uh, this is unusual. Um, I wonder if they, Bill Clinton does this. No, he, he can't do this with every group. So it, it twigged very quickly that I'd actually joined the wrong line and, and I joined a, uh, a, a, a group of Native Indians who really had come to see the president. And I was in two minds. Do I keep my mouth shut and have the experience of a lifetime. And because I read the constitution, I thought, you know, that's not within the spirit of um, what America is about. You know, I'm sure there, there are plenty of people, certainly from where I come from in, on the east side of London that would have, um, you know, under false pretenses would have just let things um, unfold. But I, I felt inspired actually by the constitution. No, I'm in the wrong place. I need to tell these guys who are clearly secret service that I'm in, I've come to the wrong place. And so I did, I, I, I quickly went over to one of the uh, secret service guys and said, I don't think I'm supposed to be here. And um, now this was before 9-11, right? So you know, they saw the funny side of it and they quickly took me to the other line. But the, the thing about that, um, that moment, that that experience, uh, was how open um, potentially it it is in America to 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 meet the highest officials of the um, of of the governing branches, whether that be the legal system or you know obviously the executive branch. And I'd been in the UK to similar meetings with the Queen. I'd met the Queen, the royal family. I'd met senior judges, but it was much more <laughs> difficult um, and took you know, weeks and months of planning and, and background checks. And um, I was just taken, not so much by the lack of security, obviously, but the, the principle that the, uh, the, president of the uh, president of the United States would meet with an, um, a party from, from you know, that particular uh, part of American society. And it's not the first time I've I've heard this uh, this this message or this uh, this practice. So you know to to answer your question, that was a big change for me. The openness of the United States um, across all stratas of society compared to my you know limited social maneuvering in the UK. Even though I did go up and down that uh, hierarchy into the upper classes a couple of times. But it was very, you know, on the UK side, it was very uncomfortable. You know, never felt I, I belonged there. Um, always felt comfortable uh, in meetings in the US with high ranking officials. Um, anyway, that's, uh, that's my short, shorthand story of, of why, one of the biggest difference, I think, between the US and the, and the UK. It's, it's a wonderful story. Thank you so much for sharing. And talk about the constitution and uh, the same, you know, the, 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 I have a slightly different angle, but uh, uh, probably uh, the same impression, uh, you know, for both of us. You know, when I started law school and the, the uh, constitution, and I feel so 
uh, puzzled by the professor keep asking the question, can the government do this under the constitution? Can the legislature do this under the constitution? And I was so confused. I thought, I thought that the law is tell the citizen what to do, not tell the government what to do. And I think this is exactly the same feeling. And it's a, it's, it's, it's a you know, systematic change from what we used to, you know, hierarchy, you know, inequality. And this is a much bigger topic, and one that I think you engage with really well, uh, Chung, is the, the, the framework of interpretation. And, and I'm, I'm just going to use that two word phrase that means so many things. Um, it's not codal law. You know, mm -hmm. it, there, there are, of course, you know, regulations which have numbers and uh, limits. But I think the, the Constitution is more about setting up a framework which um, lives, uh, you know, literally hundreds of years. And the Supreme Court can interpret it in terms of the benefit of the pursuit of, you know, happy. Um, I've forgotten the language now, but you know, you know what I'm trying to say. Um, yes. And it's the interpretation of the law which is so strong in the U.S. Uh, rather than a codal system. And I, I feel comfortable with that. You know, I, I think uh, you know the legal profession is is a is a good working um, infrastructure of interpreting laws depending on what the the plaintiff or the defendant is trying to do as an individual. So uh, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah, I'm I'm very very impressed. Thank you so much. We are running out of time, but we do want you to, to uh, make a recommendations. And uh, is there anything you would like, any book, movie you would like to recommend to our audience to watch and to enjoy? So um, I'm a huge, so I've spent a lot of time working uh, at Thomson Reuters in, um, uh, and as a consultant. And I would, I would propose that the um, as much as there is a lot of negative press with um, with Facebook and their pursuit of the metaverse, I, I was part of those early internet years, and there really hasn't in the in the late eighties and and the early nineties, and the level of skepticism with the the metaverse, which which maybe warrants another program uh, for for mm -hmm. you, is the um, it's another seismic shift in the use of data within people's lives. And I'm a, I'm a huge, um, huge proponent of what uh, uh, Facebook are trying to do and others you know, like, uh, like Tesla uh, trying to do with data to blend the virtual world with the real world. Um, so there is a book, there is a, a couple of authors who are thinking beyond where we are today, which is the mm -hmm. beginning into how do we, how do we as individuals work seamlessly within the virtual and the real world and where is our privacy really going to be protected in this world um, um and i'll leave it like that it's a it's a fascinating era we're about to move into um and it it if i was still working in a in, you know if i wanted to work i would definitely refocus my attention to the metaverse um, because i think it's going to be very exciting over the next five to ten years I will send you the link after this. Uh, Sounds good. Thank you so much. Thank you. That sounds very uh, exciting. Well, uh, we are running out of time, but uh, we look forward to welcoming you back to uh, continue to share your wisdom and insights. A nation of immigrants, Martin Hedman, automation consultant and the rolling coach. Thank you so much, Martin. Thanks, thanks so much, John. Thank you. Thank you. Aloha.